Good morning, everyone. I hope you can all hear me. We have had a few uh, tech hiccups this morning. Once again, the joys of delivering things online. Um, so thank you for your patience. Uh, we will be getting started. Um, we will probably give just another 30 seconds or so for any people who are running a bit late this morning to join in and then we will get going. Um, in the meantime, if you'd like to introduce yourselves or have any specific particular questions you want to have answered um, today, feel free to uh, pop that in the chat and I will keep an eye on that as we go through. Oh. <laughs> Hi, Jason, we can't hear you, but I appreciate the wave. <laughs> I can also see what looks like an excellent uh, antique sewing machine in your background. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> OK, well, we'll make a start, I think. We're probably expecting a couple more people along, but they can catch up with us when they get here. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks so much for coming. Um, we will start as usual with an acknowledgement of country. So QCOS acknowledges the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as the original inhabitants and, and traditional custodians of the land that we work on. That is Yagara and Turrbal land down in the southeast where I'm coming to you from, but we acknowledge the traditional owners across the state um, and pay our respects to elders past and present. We also pay our respects to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people on the line with us today. We have a commitment here at QCOS to walking alongside First Nations people towards representation, Makarata and treaty. And if you would like to acknowledge the land that you are coming to us from, please feel free to do that in the chat. We have a pretty. I'd like to, um, I'd like to acknowledge the Tarabalang Banda, the Gorang, the Gorang Gorang, and the Baili on the Tamra, which I work on, which is with the Gadajal Development Corporation. However, the Tamra and the PCCC. So, uh, coming to you from Tarabalang Banda country. Beautiful. Thanks, Jason. All right. Uh, now we, when we do this in person, we often get people to share a little bit about uh, where they're from um, and what they're working on at the moment. Um, obviously, that works a little bit differently here um, online, but please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat, as I said. Now today we do have a pretty packed schedule. So we'll look at background to Skilling Queenslanders for Work, which is the tender uh, process that we have built this particular tender writing training around. That said, if you're applying for some other training or just trying to get some basic uh, tender writing training under your belt, all of the principles and processes here will apply just as well to other training that, uh, sorry, other funding that you're looking for. Uh, we will then go into really the meat of the session, which is our methodology for applying for funding. That will take us more through three quarters of the session, really. Uh, then we'll look at some hints and tips for really crafting your responses to improve your chances of success in getting a grant or um, a piece of funding. And then have a quick look at the end at, at human rights and uh, child safe organisation responsibilities, which come along with any Queensland government funding. Oh, lovely. We've got Harvey Bay folks coming in, which is fabulous. Uh, lovely, lovely spot up there. Um, rest assured, we do have a break right in the middle of our webinar today. So um, it, I know two hours is getting on the lengthy side for, um, for a webinar and my voice, apart from anything else, will need a break. So you'll have a chance to stretch or get a cup of tea or duck off to the bathroom if you need to around about the middle. The reason we do these trainings is really to help participants prepare and present effective applications, um, as I said, particularly for skilling Queenslanders for work or SKU, uh, but also other um, grants and opportunities that come up. And this is particularly because there are, are specific ways in which applications often uh, 
fail to get their point across effectively. So lots and lots of applications for what would be really wonderful programs don't get funded. And by making a few tweaks to the preparation process and the writing of responses, uh, you can really improve your chances of getting your project idea off the ground. So that's what we're focused on today. These have all been put together over many, many years of QCOS providing uh, funding application training, uh, but also on some specific feedback we've got from funding bodies. Uh, some of this you'll see in, in the webinar today, um, some quotes specifically from some of the um, advisory committees, which have a role in assessing SKU applications with the Department of Education, or sorry, em Employment Department of Employment, Small Business and Training, which provides SKU funding. Um, and we've also also had feedback from other particularly government bodies that assess training applications uh, and we've noticed that there are some really common mistakes that people make that a bit of guidance can help you avoid. One of the other things that we will be focusing on is helping you sort of troubleshoot some of the main reasons that a submission might not quite make it uh, to the sent button. And um, we can see here some uh, research from uh, the Grants in Australia report, which came out in, I think, 2017. Over half of respondents said they'd started a grant application, which they had then not finished or not got to submission. And what you can see here is that there are some really common problems. So simply running out of time, you know, these things often, uh, oh, I'm sorry, are you, I've just had a message from Mandy asking if, Screen sharing is supposed to be on. Is are you unable to see the PowerPoint? Oh, just seeing me. I'm terribly sorry. Let me go back to screen sharing and see. It should be a nice graph. Can you see a graph now? Yep, okay, good. <laughs> As I mentioned, some tech issues this morning. I do apologise. We thought we had got everything uh, up and running correctly, but my computer was telling me something different from what you all could see, which is um, a bit uh, you know, probably indicative of um, just the morning that we have had here. I do apologise. Uh, all right, so now that you can see um, the graph, maybe what I will be telling you will make a little bit more sense. <laughs> all right, so over half of the people who responded to the grants in Australia research, um, as I mentioned, said that they just ran out of time. So we'll take you through um, some steps that we suggest that will help you Oh, not ensure because, you know, these things can never be 100% locked down, but make sure you've got a, a reasonable grasp of what the time frame is likely to be and how long things are, are supposed to take. So hopefully we'll be able to tick that first major uh, pitfall off the list. Um, another, the second biggest issue that people found was that they discovered partway through the process of writing the application uh, that the program they wanted to run wasn't properly aligned with the funding requirements. So what we're going to do um, in a little while is have a think about how we can evaluate what the actual requirements of a funding application are and how that might line up or not line up with what projects we want to run. And then how we can look at grant opportunities and see which ones are most likely to suit what we want to be delivering for our communities. Uh, a significant subsection of these respondents um, found partway through that they didn't meet eligibility criteria. So you'll see that um, reviewing the eligibility criteria and how your organisation and program idea fits uh, is something you can evaluate early on. You shouldn't need to get partway through the tender writing process before you find out whether or not um, you're eligible there. But again, this is part of tweaking the planning so that um, these things that might otherwise be missed aren't missed. So that's what we're uh, looking at for those common pitfalls that we want to avoid in the planning. And then we'll look at some, some common problems in the actual writing of responses a little bit later. Now, 
After the webinar, you will get an email with a few resources on it. And one of them is our grant on a page resource. And we really recommend um, if you uh, are thinking about applying for a grant, even if you've started, um, we encourage you to use a, a sort of one or two page overall plan that you can jot down the important points in and share with your project team so that everyone is on the same page. And you've got a really quick point of reference for all of the the critical information. And we'll be referring back to this throughout the webinar. I'll be um, highlighting key parts of um, the plan and whether or not you use this resource or you have a different um, planning document, you should be covering pretty much the same sort of set of about eight key areas in, in your planning. And we will um, have a few other things in that um, post event email as well, just other resources that might support you as you work through this process. So as I mentioned, we are looking um, today particularly at SKU or Skill and Queenslanders for Work funding. Um, we do have an introductory webinar and we know that, that the Desbet offices around the state run um, introduction sessions or information sessions for SKU. Um, we anticipate that you've probably have been to one of those information sessions or seen the, the introduction online. If you haven't, just really briefly, uh, SKU is um, a government and uh, community and economy supporting grants program, basically. It's been running for, I think, about eight years in rejigged form, and, and you'll recognise some of the names if you've been in the community sector for a long time. Um, some of the programs were around long before that as well. It's focused on uh, providing supported training that is really targeted towards helping people reduce barriers to employment um, with the programs that can be run under it varying from quite basic, simple and time limited, um, so addressing one or two really um, simple barriers to employment through to very complex programs where wraparound supports are offered for participants who are often engaged five days a week for, for many months. There, there are particular um, groups of marginalised or disadvantaged people who are often the focus of these programs. That includes young people, especially those who've disengaged from education, mature age job seekers or people who've been working for a long time in an industry that no longer has the jobs available that it used to. Uh, people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds or Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who have been marginalised or face um, particular barriers in accessing employment, uh, people with disabilities, women re-entering the workforce, uh, ADF veterans and people who've recently been released from prison are some of the other groups um, that are a particular focus for SKU programs. I think the pandemic really highlighted the importance of additional supports in the lives of so many of us um, and with so many people who perhaps were outside of the groups that we might stereotypically think may need support or help. Um, you know, recognising that, that that need for extra support and extra assistance at some points in our lives is actually really normal. That's something we all experience. Um, and and the pandemic and the effects that flowed from that, I think, really highlighted that and, and has led to maybe a bit more uh, of a sense in the broader community of recognition of the importance of uh, community based supports, which really, um, I think, adds to what it is that's valuable about the SKU programs in that it's community organisation driven specifically because community services organisations have that understanding of what the range of human needs are, have the relationships and the partnerships and the referral pathways and, and all of those sorts of things, even the skilled staff to deliver these sorts of programs. Uh, we do often take a poll if we do these events in person asking who has submitted a SKU application before. What we have found recently is that a lot of the people coming to our tender writing events haven't. This is um, their first go um, at, um, at SKU. Once, you know, every one or two in every group will have experience. So if you have applied for SKU funding before or applied for other funding and you've got any lessons from that or tips that you would like to share, please do add them um, into the chat. It's always super valuable uh, for the other participants to get that um, first-hand knowledge of what this is like from anyone who, who has been involved. 
And when we do have a few people who've done um, these applications before in the group, often the first thing they say is, it's going to take longer than you think or something along those lines. So really starting early um, is, a, is a key learning for a lot of people. So let's get into um, a sense of why we're doing applications and, and what we get the opportunity to show when we're writing our tender responses. So when we're looking at SKU in particular, there are specific aspects of the program overall and specifics to the the project that you want to roll out that you need to uh, put forward. Obviously, for other grants, these will be a little bit different, but there are some things that are really similar across grant opportunities. So things like being able to show evidence that you, your organisation can do project management, you can roll out a program, you can uh, equip, uh, equip a funding um, uh, sorry, <laughs> we'll start that again, um, that you can can acquit the funding that you've received, meet all the reporting requirements, all of those sorts of things. In terms of SKU in particular, assessors want to see that what you're suggesting, the project that you want to roll out, really does meet that core criteria of developing key skills and overcoming key barriers for people who are disadvantaged when it comes to entering or re-entering work that you've got appropriate supports that you're offering to meet those barriers and meet the needs of your participants effectively. Um, and that what you're suggesting really is likely to support these learners to make that step into usually employment, but with some SKU programs, um, engaging in further education is also a possible outcome. And to support that, they really want to see evidence of employer engagement as well. So you or your organisation have links with local industries, with local employers. You know, you have a sense of what the employment skills gaps are and, and how you can meet them. It's really important to note with SKU in particular that this is not about training for training's sake. And it's not about a registered training organisation sort of finding another way to, re to recruit students. This is about starting from the community and the community service organisation needs to be in the driver's seat for it. One of the uh, Desbit assessors that we've had contact with sums this up really nicely, saying community-based organisations who approach projects with the intent to provide genuine support and assistance to participants is what they want to see. And they can tell from the way that answers are written, from the way that you explain yourself and your idea and what justification you give, they can get a sense of that genuine understanding of what's going on in the community and willingness to address those needs. To get us sort of oriented before we start going into our planning method methodology, always trip over that word, um, they want to see that you have the capacity to recruit participants and the number of participants you expect to recruit is reasonable that you are able to provide the specific kinds of support that your participant group needs, that you're able to tailor it to your community, the industries that are looking for support um, and the particular barriers that are around there. And in that process, you can also link your participants to real employment opportunities. So that's a really quick introduction to SKU. Um, if you have other questions about SKU or you want more of an overview of the full range of funding programs that, that you can apply under, there are eight. So it's quite a lengthy, um, a lengthy summary and, and it's not something we have scope to go into um, program by program here. So if you do want to get that overview, we will include the link to the introductory webinar with our post event email as well. Uh, you're also welcome to add any particular questions you have to the chat. All right, so let's uh, get into our approach to actually writing your tender. And we break this into two parts and because we're a bunch of nerds here at QCOS and we can't resist a bit of a Star Wars joke, we've named them after everyone's favourite robots. So for R2-D2, we have 
um, our preparatory steps of building a reference library, reviewing the requirements, developing a plan and drafting your responses. And then with C3PO, we want to channel that attention to detail and neuroticism that C3PO shows. We want to create responses that are clear, concise, comprehensive, persuasive and on point. Now it can seem like quite the impossible task to do things like write both concisely and comprehensively, um, but we do have some tips to help you do that. So we'll get to that right at the end of the webinar today. So without further ado, let's get started on our first R2D2 step, which is developing a reference library. And this is one of those steps that you can start taking any time, even if you haven't identified a particular grant that you want to apply for, or maybe there's an open grant coming up and you're not sure whether you want to apply for it or not. Um, developing a reference library is going to stand you in good stead. So wherever you're at in the process, this is a step to take or start taking now. What we want the reference library to be is a single point of truth for your whole uh, organisational project team so that all of the information that you might need for a grant application is in one place. It's the latest versions of everything. You know, it's all up to date. It's all clear. And that way you don't have the possibility if there are several people working on different parts of the application of them going to different sources of information and possibly having out of date information or contradictory information. So we want to cover all of the really common information needs in um, an, a funding application. They will almost all ask for things like audited financial statements for SKU in particular, that's a minimum of the last two years, insurance and banking details, your business certifications, if you're um, a not-for-profit listed with the ACNC or ORIC, all of those sorts of things, they will want that certification. It's becoming more and more common that um, funders want resumes of key staff or position descriptions for key roles that you will recruit for in rolling out your project. Um, this is wasn't as common a few years ago, so this is something to really think about um, putting together before you start submitting a funding application. They will often want a brief description of your organisation and we suggest doing a couple of them, one that is very, very brief and bare bones and then one that is a bit longer and a bit more detailed. And that way, if you start, you open up a funding application and they want a 25 word summary, you've got something to start with there. But if they, they give you a bit more, maybe you've got 250 words to, to write your response in, you've, you've got something that you can expand a little bit on the higher end of that as well. In particular, these funding applications will often require you to give a bit of an overview of your organisational capability. So having things like a record of the programs and projects that have been rolled out, um, maybe the final reports for projects or for um, grant acquittals that you've done previously, having all that saved in your resources, your reference library, sorry, is a good idea. And we also suggest that you save any copies of past applications and in particular the feedback that you've received for them. It can be a little bit disheartening if you have applied for funding and you don't get it and there's feedback about areas of weakness in your application. That's never a nice thing to receive. But by saving that in your reference library, you can then use that feedback to make sure that you're either filling a gap that you left in a previous application or strengthening it in an area that had some weakness. And this can also be the case in successful applications. You know, you might be ticked off on a whole lot of things and you did well enough to get your project approved, but there'll be some feedback about how you could strengthen your application um, that might get you across the line in a more competitive funding round. You might also like to uh, include in your reference library a sort of list of ideas for grants, you know, if there's something, you've got a particular project in mind, you see a need in your community, you've got an idea for how it could be filled, but you can't find a grant that's open at the moment that could fund it, might be an idea to start a list, you know, can even just be a Word document that staff can add their ideas to um, of potential um, programs to apply for funding for in the future. And that's never a bad thing to have a go-to list in one place that um, 
you can just then have in mind when another, you know, an email crosses your desk and it says, you know, Brisbane City Council have these grants open for funding or, you know, the Department of Child Safety has these grants open for funding, whatever it is you can think, oh, well, there was that idea that someone popped on the list that might suit that well. We do have a little uh, checklist on the back of our uh, grant on a page uh, resource. So um, we've tried to make sure that everything that is particularly essential is on a checklist somewhere. Um, and that can also be something if you decide to start a uh, reference library, um, this might be something that you will share with your teammates or um, all of staff to help them get their heads around uh, the things that are online for inclusion in that. Now this is a bit of um, a time consuming process and you will be waiting to hear back on some of these things probably. You know, it's often the finance officer, an operations manager or a CEO who has um, things like copies of audited financial statements, insurance details, that sort of thing. You know, you might be waiting a couple of weeks for resumes of key staff, that sort of thing. So particularly important to get this step started really early on. Now, a second R is to review the requirements. And this is about avoiding that problem that we saw in the, the Grants Australia um, survey responses where around about a third, I think, of the people who'd stopped an, an application partway through realised that they were not actually going to meet the requirements once they'd already started the application. So what we want to do here is think about what is the purpose of the particular grant that we're going for um, and where does that fit or not fit with the project that we want to roll out. Now for SKU, the assessors suggest that you sort of start with the project idea and then build out from there identifying possible grant opportunities rather than trying to kind of uh, massage an idea you have so that it meets the requirements um, of a grant, you're better off sort of shelving an idea and waiting for a grant that's really suitable to it than, than trying to make something fit where it's not going to. Um, assessors do tend to be able to identify when an idea has been massaged to fit within particular funding guidelines. And they suggest that you think about the people that you work with on a daily basis and developing projects that are going to work for that group. So you're really starting from the ground up. We suggest that you think also about your organisation's core purpose and values and the kinds of programs that you're already delivering. So chances are if you say your organisation or your team works with young people, you've got really solid relationships with young people, other youth services, schools and that sort of thing, then one of the uh, SKU program areas that focuses on young people as the cohort of interest is likely to be suitable. Whereas one of the ones that focuses on, say, uh, helping uh, mums with young children get back into the workforce or helping people who have exited a um, one industry and need help to get into another one, it's probably not going to align as well. There are risks that you need to consider if you think, oh, well, maybe I can squeeze it, this project idea into this funding application. Um, you're more likely with that sort of thing to not be able to show that you fulfill all of the criteria really well. Um, and even if you get through and you get the funding, often an organisation that then has to roll out a program that isn't ideally suited to their experience and their cohort will really struggle to do that. And I'll just highlight we do have uh, right in the middle of our project plan, the project idea box. Um, and this is where you sort of think about what your core idea is, even if you don't have a really solid sort of detailed um, idea to work on. There are other things that we'll go through that that will help there. Um, and then once you've got that core idea, you can think about which grants might be appropriate. So as I mentioned for SKU, there are eight different programs to choose between and they go from working really intensively with young people over a long period to providing a few sessions of job skill training. So huge variation there. And we suggest that to identify the most appropriate um, program to apply for funding under, you actually contact your regional Desbet office. 
um, they will not only be able to tell you whether your idea aligns with SKU in general, they'll be able to tell you the most suitable program to apply under. Um, and most of the offices also provide some support for actually writing your application as you go through. We've got a few other um, sources to look at sort of collections of grants to get a sense of, of what's there, but also to see whether there's a grant that's more seems more aligned with a particular um, project idea that you have. All of these are links, so when you get um, a copy of the presentation in your post event email, you'll be able to just click on each of those and it should take you to the page in question. So when you, you're first thinking about whether your project idea aligns with the requirements of the grant, there are a few key questions you want to ask. So does the purpose of the grant align with your organisational purpose? Does the participant group overlap with the group of participants that your service regularly works with? Do you have a good understanding of what you'll need to do to roll it out if you get the funding? With SKU in particular, for I think six or seven of the eight programs, you need to have a pre-existing relationship with a registered training organisation or RTO. Um, before you even apply, you need to nominate that RTO in your application and they expect you to also have some kind of collaborative work or partnership with other community services that you can evidence in your application to show how you'll get additional supports or community engagement in. And they want to see support from employers in your area saying, yes, you know, not, yes, I would definitely employ someone who finished this, this program, but um, confirming, for example, that a skills gap that you've identified in your local um, community is there, confirming that the training program that you've put together would result in people having the skills they need for entry level positions that are open in your local area, that sort of thing. You also want to make sure, and this applies again, regardless of what kind of funding you're going for, that you either have capacity to roll out your project with your current staff, or you have the organisational capacity to recruit relevant staff as quickly as is needed to get the project rolling. That brings us then to a really key area of focus, which is our participants. So as the SKU assessor mentioned a couple of slides back, they really recommend you start with your participants and think about what would be useful to them. Um, alternatively, you may be partnering with an organisation who has a cohort that's a little bit different to yours and they'll bring the expertise on working with that cohort while you bring something else to the table what might be the relationships that you have with local employers and the RTO or that sort of thing. So with SKU, we talked through the kind of target groups for SKU participation and of course with other opportunities, there will be particular target groups, maybe a very narrow demographic, maybe much broader, but start thinking about your organisation's client group or community that you serve um, and the particular experience that you have in working with groups in that community and make sure that the project that you're suggesting has, um, has a basis in what you know your community needs. Once you've got a sense of what your general project is going to look like, even if it's not detailed at this stage, and you know what participant group you, you'll be looking to uh, connect with, you want to think about what impacts you want your program to have. And it might be um, broken into short term and long term impacts. You know, short term, you might want to have participants leaving a relatively short project knowing how to find job opportunities online, apply for them and present themselves at an interview, for example. And you might also have some longer term impacts that you um, are not necessarily as core to the funding um, purpose, sort of uh, where the rubber re meets the road, but are really positive in the longer term, like creating greater opportunities for community involvement and hoping to see some social isolation reductions or those sorts of things. Um, we do uh, suggest exploring the idea of a program logic or theory of change. Um, we did a webinar on that just last week, which I think will be online soon if you want to check that out. And that's basically a way of mapping between your project idea and the impact that you want to have and seeing whether 
those activities that you're planning as part of your project do logically lead to the kinds of impacts that you're looking for. And that can be really helpful as you're preparing for a funding application as well, or really preparing any project that you want to roll out at work. There will be a question in a lot of grant applications as well about what your organisation specifically offers. So this might be some special area of knowledge or some set of community connections that your organisation has that another organisation that applied for this funding might not. And this is sometimes called your value add, which is quite a corporate term and probably one that a lot of us in the community services aren't as comfortable with. Um, but what this is really getting at is what are your strengths as an organisation? And that might be that you have, you know, 25 years of experience working with this particular demographic in this particular community. And so you have a really deep understanding of what barriers they face to employment and a history of, of really effectively engaging with them. It might be that you have very, very strong connections with a whole range of other services. So you can not only provide direct support to participants while they're going through your program, but you can also make sure that whatever needs they have that arise, you can link them in with appropriate supports, all of those sorts of things. So that's the general sort of starting point in, in your planning. You want to think about project idea, your participants, what you want to achieve and, and why it is that your organisation is a good one to have this funding and to roll out this program. We're going to look in a little bit more detail now um, about or in a moment about the specific SKU criteria, so the assessment criteria that you will have questions about if you apply for Skilling Queenslanders for work. As a general introduction, there are five areas and these areas are quite similar across a lot of funding uh, opportunities. The first is capacity to manage, which is something that we've already talked about, your financial viability, your experiencing run, experience running projects and that sort of thing. The second is servicing community and industry needs, which we'll talk about in a little bit more detail shortly. Um, this is, can be different between funding opportunities, but most funding in the community sector will be looking for you to evidence that you're meeting community need. That generally is a major focus of, of the funding in our area, unsurprisingly. Uh, strategies to assist participants come next. Now, this is really important with SKU um, because SKU is looking to fund community-based organisations to provide training or other job services. This is about getting organisations who understand barriers to employment, who understand the range of human needs that might interfere with employment, and they then use that understanding to inform the strategies they develop to support their participants to get better outcomes than they would if they engaged in, say, mainstream training. Um, this is also a kind of criteria that you're likely to see in other funding opportunities in the community sector. You know, a lot of them will want to see that you've got um, services that you will provide in kind to your participants. So if someone attends a group and they identify that there's a challenge they're experiencing in their families and the group facilitator either has some capacity to support them to meet those needs or knows where to refer them and can facilitate a referral to services that will, those sorts of things. There are also really practical strategies in SKU that you need to be thinking about. Um, so we see a lot of examples for, uh, for uh, uh, things that you might sort of, they're so simple you might overlook them, like transport to and from activities, help getting a driver's licence, help getting ID. Um, those sorts of things are really common. Some of these programs provide food, creches for children so their parents can participate. Um, all sorts of things come under strategies to assist participants. If you haven't already and you have the opportunity to watch the intro to SKU webinar, you'll see heaps of examples, particularly of the supports that are provided in the more intensive SKU programs. And it gives a really good sense of the scope there. Of course, any funding um, application will want you to outline the outcomes that you expect to achieve. This is where having mapped out your potential impacts earlier comes in handy um, and something along the lines of value for money is going to come in in most of these as well. And this gives us a really nice sense um, of what's going to be required to roll out a SKU program. 
And that can then help us start mapping out the kinds of resources that we're going to need. So at this point in your planning, you want to start really thinking about not only resources in terms of how much you're going to have to apply in terms of the budget for your project, but also what are the worker hours that are required? And not just staff who are rolling out this particular project, but what about the administration, the human resources and the management time that will be needed? the physical resources that will be needed. Will you need tablets or computers? You know, will you need a car or a minivan to help transport people to different activities? You know, will you need books? Will you need food? All of those sorts of things. Now, it's important to um, consider when it comes to resources that you are expected to provide some within SKU delivery um, in-kind services. So, it's expected that some of the supports that your participants require would be provided by the services already running within your organisation. So if you, for example, have a family counselling team within your organisation and you know that family issues are quite common among your, your target group for your project, SKU, under SKU you would be expected to have a way of getting support within that family counselling team or a case management team or a housing or emergency relief team, whatever it was that the need was likely to be, um, that you either have some capacity to support that within your organisation or you have really well-established referral pathways, if not active partnerships with local organisations who can meet those needs. So that's really important to consider in your resourcing as well. And you want to, you know, you can't know in advance exactly what amount of every resource there is going to be, but you want to get at this point to a general sense of what are the large human resources, sort of large scale, who's going to need to be involved, what different across what different teams, that sort of thing. How much is it probably going to cost to, to roll this out? How much will you need to be applying for in terms of funding? And what other organisations do you need to be working with or have relationships with? And what are those physical resources that you're going to need to roll it out? Once you've got all of that sort of clear in your head or starting to become clear, you'll be in a position to then revisit those requirements. So this is where step two, are, reviewing the requirements uh, comes in, you can then go back to the funding requirements um, that should be really clearly publicly stated um, and see whether the bones of your plan aligns with what the requirements of the funding opportunity are. Now, just bear with me, my voice is getting a little bit croaky, so I'm going to drink some tea. All right. So let's move on to step three, which is developing a plan. At this point, we're going to sound a little bit repetitive and ask you to go back to the funding guidelines and read them probably for the third time. That can seem a bit redundant, but acknowledging that the time between first looking at guidelines for funding um, and getting to this really midpoint of your planning or application process, a lot of the detail would have slipped your mind. So it's a really good idea to go back in and have a, a deep dive, really. You've also got the bones of your plan laid out by this point, so you can see what does and doesn't line up. For SKU in particular, there's a guide to applying for funding for each of the eight programs that run under SKU. And each of them has a PDF set of guidelines, very easy to find online and download, but we will also include some links in your email. These always outline the program purpose, the assessment criteria, the things that can be included and are excluded from budget asks and your expected outcomes or key performance indicators. They make that very, very clear and super useful. If you've ever applied for a grant where those things aren't clear, you'll appreciate having it all spelled out there. You can also download a, a they call it, I think, a provider's pack on the Desbit website, which has, as well as the, the funding guidelines, it has a sample service agreement, which is super useful when you can sit, you're trying to figure out what resources you might need to uh, use if you do get the funding. You can have a look at the application portal. It's a useful application portal. You register, 
you kind of get in there, you can start an application and you can save your progress, go in and out as many times as you like, change things, upload things, take them down, upload something updated, all of that kind of stuff until you actually press the submit button. Doesn't matter how many times you go back in there. Uh, there's a user support guide for um, these things and frequently asked questions guides. Um, there's also quite a detailed list of um, what is expected and what evidence you need to provide for each of the application criteria. And we're going to summarise those shortly, um, but we really recommend looking at the PDFs because they do go into more detail than we can provide in this webinar. So then we're looking at the key aspects of your project, which should be starting to come clearer in your mind now. Um, you want to be able to answer all of these questions at this point in your planning process. I'm not going to go through them all now. I know you can all read and you will, you know, if you're using this as sort of a, a tool while you're actually in the process of, of writing your application, it's good to know the questions are all there for you. A couple of key questions there that are usually applicable across funding opportunities, SKU or otherwise. Some basics about you want to be able to really clearly, succinctly uh, describe what the project is and the benefits that it will have and who you'll be seeking to involve. Some things for SKU particularly you want to be clear on the industry or employment contacts that you've made and how they will um, inform your program, how you'll make links with them, how you'll help participants get jobs in those areas um, and how you'll be addressing um, particular barriers to service access, uh, sorry, to employment access. So that usually means what kind of support services are you going to provide or arrange for your participants. Now we do have the contact details for the funders here um, for SKU. So again, these are links, you can just click on them, they'll take you where you need to go. Um, and that's really for, for your reference. There is, as you can see, centralised phone line and email. So you don't need to know who your regional office or who the ideal contact is. You can go through the centralised stream and you'll get there. Um, the regional offices are lovely, by the way. They are all super keen to see SKU projects succeed. So um, don't be nervous about getting in touch with them. They're always really happy to hear from potential SKU providers. So that's SKU. Now, what are the other relationships that you're going to need to develop in this process? If you are rolling out a SKU project, we've already mentioned you need your RTO um, your registered training organisation identified early. Really highly recommended that you develop a memorandum of understanding that formalises that arrangement before you put your application in. And you also need to have partnerships with other service providers. Now this can get really tricky because things involving other people always take a lot of time. So we would recommend that when it comes to your partnerships or your collaborative relationships, you start building them early. Ideally, build on relationships you already have. Maybe you have partnerships or MOUs with relevant external stakeholders that you can build on. Reach out to them, have a chat, brainstorm ideas, all of those sorts of things. Um, just be aware that it will take some time in the setup but it will save a whole lot of time later on if you have those things nutted out early. And once again, we have a little box on our plan for who you might need to consider as your key partners. Um, we would suggest also if you have a project plan in development that you get them on board um, early enough to have input into what the plan looks like. Getting those extra eyes and different perspectives on your plan will help you troubleshoot some things and might help you avoid potential problems entirely, which is just that's the benefit of getting um, those different uh, perspectives and areas of expertise in there. We suggest you then look at who your tender team is. So your tender team is sort of a subset of your key partners. And these are the people who are actually involved in putting the application together in some way. If you are in uh, an organisation like any of the ones that I have previously worked for, your admin officer or admin worker is going to be invaluable and probably needs to be dialed in pretty early on. Finance staff and managers are really important. Um, you might have particular people, say a CEO, a chair or um, 
uh, of your board of directors, management committee, um, who needs to sign off on things, all of those sorts of things. You might also have some external stakeholders who need to be involved. So um, the RTO that you're partnering with will ideally be actively involved in this part of the process as well. Maybe some of those key service partnerships and employers um, can have some really useful things to add, even if they're not actively involved in writing your application responses. Again, you can map that out on our plan on a page, keep it really clear and simple. And what you want to do with your tender team, really, our, our highest recommendation is have a kickoff meeting with everyone on the tender team there. Get people together, particularly if they work in different teams or organisations, it will be really important for them to get to know each other and develop a bit of a sense of familiarity and trust. If you can do that, first up and if you can be really clear on what the purposes of the project are, what the requirements of the grant are and what everyone who will be involved will need to do, you're going to avoid a whole lot of problems later on. You know, it's super common when we're looking at, at grants or programs that require partnerships for there to be miscommunication, different expectations, senses of, oh, but you said you were going to do that, or no, I didn't, you said you were going to do it, all of that kind of stuff, which can just absolutely derail the planning or the implementation. So getting really clear on those things and making a time to meet up regularly and specifying what the next steps are, who's responsible and when things will be done will be really important. You might want to look into some project management software or programs for this sort of thing. If your organisation uses something like this already, see whether your external stakeholders can be linked into it. Um, but even something as simple as, you know, an Excel spreadsheet can be set up where the person responsible for a particular task is identified, due dates, that sort of thing. It is a little bit tricky doing action planning as a team. It does tend to take a little bit longer than if you sit down to develop a plan by yourself. Uh, the benefit, though, is that you're more likely to identify problems in advance or potential barriers in advance that you need to work around. Um, you're also more likely to get the buy-in of other people on your tender team if they're involved in the planning. They're likely to be more committed. They're likely to feel more motivated if they've been part of the process from the ground up. And they're also going to be in a better position to tell you if some action is just not possible given the resources that they've got, and that could be essential later on. And the really important thing is that by the end of an initial meeting or shortly after an initial meeting, there is a very, very clear set of steps that need to be taken. And we suggest when you think about timing for these steps, you think about the due date for the application and then you work back from there. So maybe the due date of the application, say for SKU, I think is the 21st of March. You want to have everything there ready for submission a day or two before, so the 19th or the 20th. The, maybe your CEO, the man, the uh, your management committee, whoever will need a few days to uh, review the documents. So you might want to have everything in order by the 15th. That means you need to, and so on and so on and so on, backwards in time to figure out when the due dates for each of the actions that leads up to that will be. Again, on our page, our resource page, you will have a little box for key activities. There's not enough space for the full plan there, but this is a space where you can highlight maybe really absolutely crucial um, activities and due dates. It is important in this process to think about evaluation, which is often missed in uh, applications and planning processes. Um, this is becoming a really big problem in a lot of grant applications um, because increasingly they are asking for evaluation plans and they want to see that something solid is in place. So for SKU, Evaluation methods are kind of built into the contract. So uh, SKU providers do a short monthly report um, and then a longer report, final report at the end of the project, as well as a spreadsheet that shows the outcomes for each of the participants. So whether they withdrew, completed, went into work, went into other education, that sort of thing. You may have other um, methods for evaluating programs that your organisation uses. You know, you might use anything from um, engagement, you know, attendance, 
uh, staff observations and reports, those sorts of things through to um, surveys. We have an example at the end of the webinar today, you'll get a survey, which I very much hope you fill in. Um, that kind of feedback makes a huge difference. Um, you might need to think about how you can resource evaluation in SKU, for example, there isn't additional funding for evaluation, you're expected to evaluate as part of the delivery, there's not specific grant funding for that. Um, what the payoff, I guess, is there, um, even if, if it's a bit tricky and time consuming, resource consuming to do, is that if you get good data, for the evaluation of the project you're applying for now, you can then roll that into your next application and it can become part of the evidence, part of your organisational capacity demonstration. We delivered this SKU program between 2024 and 2025 and we had an average completion rate of 90% and 75% went into work, a further 10% went back into education, whatever your outcomes are that data collection then becomes part of your evidence for your capacity in your next application. The key thing here is to make sure evaluation isn't an afterthought. The number of organisations or project teams who don't think about this in advance, even if it's not required in your application, um, think about it now because the chances that you will have the time and resources to roll it out effectively at the end of a project if it hasn't been planned in advance are really really low <laughs> so just get onto that again um, QCOS has a bunch of resources on evaluation we've had a did a really recent couple of workshops um, on it that will be available online soon um, and I'm um, more than happy to have a chat or send out any resources. You can most welcome to just email us and ask if you have further questions about evaluation planning, because I know we only have a couple of minutes to spend on it today, and it's not an area that is especially well known in the in the sector at the moment. Uh, once again, we do have that little box on your page for a summary of what your evaluation plans are. And now just before uh, we break for our five minute break in the middle, um, at this point, we're about to start drafting our responses, so we want to make sure we've got these key things in place. You want an action plan with the people responsible for each action and the key dates really clearly spelled out. You want clarity on what the necessary outcomes or KPIs are and whether you've got the resources to meet them. You want to know what those key requirements are. You want to be clear on who the tender team is and what they will be doing. Um, and just make sure you've got a checklist of inclusions for your grant um, or your tender application. Now, often that will be embedded in the application. So again, the SKU portal is really helpful with this. They do have a checklist. Um, and there are some things if you haven't filled in a box or haven't uploaded something where it's necessary that you do, you actually can't submit anyway. Um, otherwise, we have a generic checklist on the back of our project on a page, grant on a page sheet. So that's our uh, first two R2D2 steps. As promised, we are going to have a five minute break. Uh, it's 10.30 now, so I am going to uh, ten, turn off the camera. Um, I'm going to have a little bit of a stretch. I know that I'm feeling a bit tight after an hour of sitting here. Uh, so I will see you back here in five minutes at 10.35 uh, to get through the second half of the webinar. All right, if my camera stops jumping around oddly, we can get back into it. It has got me in a very odd spot on the screen now. I'm not sure what happened there, but uh, also not sure how to fix it at this point. So I think we might just have to put up with it. <laughs> Uh, glad to see you're back. Uh, hopefully everyone is back from their breaks, but if not, they'll no doubt be able to catch up. So let's get back into it. Uh, you might have been a bit surprised that we got to halfway through the webinar before we started on actually drafting the responses, given that this is a tender writing uh, training. But I think what you will see um, in a few minutes time is that all of that planning and preparation actually leads directly into your response writing. So having all of that preparatory work done will make this process much, much quicker. 
than it would otherwise be. First, though, we need to be clear about what we're working on when we're writing a response to selection criteria. Um, and it's very different from a lot of the other writing that we do. So if you're like me, when you were in school, you learned how to write on the basis of sort of creating interest and using fun language, maybe developing an interesting storyline with twists and things that aren't clear that will only be resolved in time. And that's a very exciting way to write a mystery novel, but it's not what funding responses, respond, sorry, funding assessors want at all. We sort of turn that upside down and it's not nearly as much fun, but if you do use this format, uh, chances are that the assessors will appreciate it and the marks that you get on your assessments uh, will be better. So what we want to do for all of the areas that we talk about um, is create a response that really quickly and clearly has the key message up top. So first sentence should be the main point, the topic sentence, whatever you want to call it, of your response to a particular question. You then want to have any supporting points come from that and be backing everything you can up with examples, data or evidence. That doesn't mean doing a reference list the way that you would for a school assignment. Um, and it doesn't mean that you have to have, you know, something from an evidence, uh, you know, evidence-based, data-based um, source for everything that you say. But the more that you can back up your key statements with either examples from your work, from your organisation's practice, or from research, the stronger your responses will look. So as we get into writing the responses, let's just do a little bit of a review of what SKU is asking for. Um, if you're applying for SKU again, that's your capacity to manage, service and community and industry needs, what support you're going to provide, the outcomes you're going for, and cost or value for money. And we're going to look at each of these, do a little bit of a, a whirlwind tour, I suppose, of each of them and look at what you might say um, and how you might evidence what you say in turn. But first, we're going to have a look at how we might break down a particular criteria to ensure that we're addressing every part of it because each of the criteria, as you'll, as you'll see as we work through, actually has multiple points that you need to cover. And the way that this works, at least with SKU, and it may be different, slightly different with some other funding opportunities, but this is a quite a common process, um, is there will be a number of points allocated to each question or each response to each question in a funding application. And then those points will be further distributed among each of the key themes of the question. So, for example, um, we're going to look in a moment at breaking down one of these um, one of these criteria to see what different uh, kind of clumps of points there are within there. Um, but the important thing to recognise is that each particular aspect that the assessor is looking for will have a certain number of points allocated to it. And if you don't address that aspect, you won't get those points. So say there's an overall 50 points with 10 points attached to each of the five uh, assessment criteria those points will then be further break, broken down, so in capacity to manage, maybe there's three points to be allocated to financial viability, uh, three points to operational viability, two points to governance viability, um, and a couple of points to um, the uh, your ex previous experience in, in rolling out a, a, a project or, or a quitting a grant. Now that's not that's just an example. It's fictionalised. It's not how um, how the skew assessors necessarily break it down, but that will give you a sense of the importance of addressing every single aspect when it comes to these criteria. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that in a really competitive funding process, even a couple of points being missed can be the difference between getting funded and not. So we have heard, for example, of grants that are quite undersubscribed. So any, you know, decent application that, that is worth funding will go through. But there are some some grants that are so oversubscribed that it is only the absolute peak of the applications that get through. So there, there are a whole lot of applications that the funder would like to fund that are viable, that everything looks 
like it would be good, but there were just one or two things missing in that application. It didn't get all of the points that it could have, and so it doesn't get funded. What we want to do is give you a process for breaking down your responses to minimise the risk that that's going to happen. So let's look at criteria two, which is servicing community and industry needs. And what we can see when we go a little bit further into our presentation, we, we will actually show you some, some snaps from the portal, um, is that while the overall servicing community and industry needs is only five words. The actual question that's asked around this is several lines long and it has a whole lot of different things that go into it. So when you go to answer this particular application question, what you need to answer is how the training you're providing will address local industry skill and labour needs and whether there are any impacts on the wider community and how the project responds to the particular concerns, the particular barriers to employment and the particular industry needs in your local conditions. So it's not enough to just have a good idea or one that would work, you know, in one area, maybe not so well in yours. You actually need to be evidencing your understanding of your own community and the needs of your demographic group. And what the uh, advisory committees who are involved in the application and assessment process will look for is responses that show that they have that understanding, they're addressing all of those things that we've talked about, but they're also interested in the demonstration of local community support. So that's often evidenced through partnerships and letters of support links with other initiatives or services and links to industry stakeholders or employers. So you can't just say, yes, we will address local needs. You need to evidence how you're going to do that. And you probably need to evidence that the needs are there in the first place before you go to that point. And that's why we want a systematic process for breaking down these things and kind of mapping out what needs to go into the response. So we'll look at that now. What we suggest is that you literally pull the pieces of the question apart and then you think about which parts seem more or less heavily weighted and get a sense of how much of your response you'll then dedicate with the, the things that seem more critical, <clears throat> probably getting a little bit more of your response and things that seem less critical getting a little bit less. Again, this example we're giving here isn't exact, um, but if you had about 450 words to cover um, this particular criteria, <clears throat> we've suggested that you might break it down something like this. So the first thing we need to do is we need to evidence that there's a relevant need in the community. So say I was planning um, a Get Set for Work program, which is one of the, the more intensive programs under SCUIT requires wraparound support and works with specifically with young people who've disengaged from the schooling system. If I'm going to say there's need in my community for Get Set for Work, one of my key points is going to be that there is a need for this kind of program in my community. I have to show that there's a need for it before there's any point in my talking about what I'm going to do. So my first key message would be that there is high youth unemployment in my community, or perhaps that there is a particularly high rate of disengagement from education in my community. And I might use uh, data from um, my local government area or one of the, the statistical areas, which is a term that is used in the government statistical reporting. Uh, so each of us lives in a local government area, as we know. We also live in a region um, of Queensland and within the state of Queensland. And there's different data sources for different levels there. For myself, being um, on the south side of Brisbane, I would ideally be using data that focused on the south side of Brisbane. Um, if I was using data from, say, the Sunshine Coast, that wouldn't be evidence for there being a need in my community. Uh, and still less if I was using data from North Queensland. Now, this can get really tricky 
for people who are in areas that maybe are not as well studied or well served by data sources. But we at QCOS do have a series of data dashboards for quite a few regions in Queensland where our amazing data analyst has put together freely available data sources. So I really encourage you to look at those. Um, that data analyst, Amy, will also be doing a webinar for us on Thursday specifically about using data in your SKU applications. So. Um, if you would like to do a little bit of a deeper dive on that, I really encourage you to come along. Amy did that webinar uh, last year just as a bit of a trial to see if there was interest and we got just so much interest that we realised we had to run it again. Uh, I can highly recommend it. Now, we then would want to move on to the impact on community. So my key message again with my fictional Get Set for Work program would probably resolve around there being poor social health and economic outcomes for young people who disengage from school and experience long periods of, of unemployment. And I would probably be able to find a really recent Australian research report that backed that up because that's a, that's a pretty uh, common finding um, to have. And then move on to the project need. So my key message there might be my Get Set for Work program will reduce the barriers that these young people who are disengaged from education are experiencing and link them directly to work opportunities. Um, as evidence for this, I would, if I had previously or my organisation had previously run a program that worked on barriers to employment for young people or linking young people with employment opportunities, training them in job skills, anything like that, I would use reports from those programs as my evidence there. That can be as simple as saying, please see the attached project report, job skills 2022. And then I would literally just upload that project report into the attachment box. Uh, finally, local support. Um, I would want to make sure that my assessor could really clearly see that I had strong relationships with local employers. And what I would do to evidence that would be letters of support from those employers. Now, a couple of key points with letters of support, because this is another area where things can really go sideways. They must be on organisational letterhead, and that can be email, you know, signatures if it's not sort of a, a PDF or a paper letter. Um, and that must show the employer's sort of formal details. So the assessor knows that this isn't, you know, Uncle Joe did up a quick letter to support our program, uh, but this is a legitimate employer in the local area. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, that's not, they don't need to say, I will definitely employ people from this program. But what they need to say is something along the lines of, you know, this program will be addressing a serious skills gap we had. And if I have a vacancy, I will consider employing a participant who had completed this program. Something along those lines it needs to be really specific. It can't just be this organisation is really great and I love what they do. That might be true, but it's not evidence in terms of what assessors are looking for. They want to see in letters of support that there is very clear, specific information about the commitments that other services or employers are going to make. Um, and that they're really timely. So you don't want a letter of support that you used last year, for example. You need to have one that's really recent. And that's another thing, by the way, that often takes a lot more time uh, than you think it will. So start getting those letters of support really early. Now, the next few slides, we have an example of a not bad, but not particularly well-written sort of fictionalised uh, assessment response. It's not real, we did make it up, as you might see from some of the uh, the town names and things in there. I'm not going to try your patience by reading it all out, uh, but this is here for you to use as a little bit of um, an activity to look at what is a decent sort of description of a problem and a program that could help with it, but that isn't going to cut it when it comes to um, an assessment process. And what we've done over the next few slides is highlight particular ways that it could be improved. And again, you can look through this in your own time if you want to, um, but you can see there's a few key things. So there wasn't any uh, detail in the previous, um, in the previous slide about where information had come from or statistics. We've added those in. 
when we looked at things like impact on community, again, there wasn't that evidence backing up the message. So they've got the key message there, but not the evidence backing it up. And what we really need to see as well, and this is one of those places where a program uh, logic or a theory of change could really help, is showing that there's a clear rationale and an evidence-based rationale for the project. So what will happen here is that we will use the skills and the capabilities that we've already developed in these ways and that will address this local need that we've already evidenced. That's the kind of rationale for a program that assessors are looking for. And just as mentioned in terms of letters of support, we need to make sure that those are in there, that they are specific to the program and that, that they are current. Now, assessment criteria can be uh, a bit of a beast and sometimes they're really hard to answer, but they also give us a number of really clear opportunities. And if, we, if we're very targeted in how we develop our responses, those opportunities include things like showing that we really understand the program and what the funders want to see. A, an organisation that has developed a solid program logic that has planned things well, that has established the relationships that would be needed to roll out a program effectively, will come across much, much more strongly in their application than one who hasn't. There are just innumerable differences in the ways that language are used, is used and how things are described. And the assessors are really experienced. You know, they can look at an application and see when that preparatory work has been done. So each of these assessment criteria each of the questions that is asked is an opportunity for you to show that you have done that work. It's also your opportunity to show why your organisation can offer things that another organisation can't and so why you should get this funding. This goes back to what we called our value add earlier on. What is your particular expertise? What is your experience, your placement within the community that makes you the right organisation to fund for this? So as we go through the next few slides, which are pretty dry, <laughs> I will warn you, and all about specific criteria and how to address them, just keep in mind that even though the questions are big and it takes work to pull them apart and answer them effectively, if you do this systematically and if you do it well, it's an amazing opportunity and the assessors will see the work that have, has gone into it. Now with uh, SKU funding, it's useful to know that in most of the regions in Queensland, uh, stage one, which is about that capacity to manage, every assessment, uh, sorry, every application gets assessed on. Only those applications that pass this assessment criteria will go on to a stage two evaluation where the other criterion, um, including the funding um, question, will be assessed. So stage one, everyone, and then stage two, the rest of the uh, criteria are only looked at for those whose stage one response is strong enough um, to justify it. Now, this is done by uh, advisory committees and DESBIT staff. The advisory committees are regionally specific as well. So rest assured that when you are talking about the need in your community, why something is needed in your community where it might not be elsewhere or a particular targeted approach is needed, there will be people on that committee assessing your responses who are familiar, if not with your specific local area, at least with your region. Uh, so it's not just a matter of uh, someone sitting down in southeast Queensland looking at things for far north Queensland or the northwest, that sort of thing. Uh, it's people who are members of industries, community services organisations and that sort of thing in your region, as well as DESBIT staff from your regional office who assess these. Basic points before we get started going through each of the criteria. Get some clarity about what's being asked and what needs to be included. You're better off mapping this out first than just getting into writing. Put your key messages up front. Again, we talked about uh, clarity and conciseness and comprehensiveness maybe being um, in a bit of a battle with each other, but we will go into that shortly, I promise. Um, and just make sure that you're providing evidence to back up your claims. So if you are going through a SKU application shortly, these are your sort of uh, key slides to refer back to. 
Now, we will also link to the more detailed uh, DESBIT PDF that goes through what should be included in each of these criteria. In brief, for capacity to manage, as we've already talked about, this is about your organisation's sustainability and ability to manage funds. This is where those audited statements for the, from the last two years comes in, that hopefully will be in your reference library, um, and resumes for key staff or position descriptions for key staff you'll recruit are essential. This is really trying to get at an overall sense of whether or not your organisation can do what it's, you're saying it can do, can run the program that you want to do, whether it has a track record and the staff who have the expertise to do it uh, with the particular cohort that you've identified and in the particular um, uh, region that you've identified. Uh, important point here is that it really is area specific. Um, we have heard stories about applications that maybe have been copied and pasted and then maybe the application is for uh, a program up in Weeper, but for some reason it's continuously being referred to as Bundaberg and that's because the organisation works across two regions uh, and someone didn't do the job of developing their responses from scratch and making sure they were really were responding to the local uh, need. So uh, just a little bit of a tip there to um, be careful about the dangers of copying and pasting. <laughs> Now, this is what it will look like when you come to your uh, SKU application. You can see we've got a really big question about capacity to manage, which is why pulling it apart and mapping it out is so important. You have 2,800 characters, which we figured out translates to around about 350 to 400 words to answer this question. That is not a lot when you see how much has to go into it. You can see a little 200 plus at the top right of the box there. Um, that is a bit of a warning when you get within 200 characters of the character limit tells you that that's happening. What we recommend and what the Desbit staff also recommend is that you actually develop your draft responses in Word. And you can do all your editing there. Um, it will also tell you how many characters you're using if you highlight the paragraph or two paragraphs that you've written. And once they're in a position you're happy with, you can copy and paste them into the application itself. And notice you've got boxes for um, your uh, audited statements and your staff and resumes or PDs. These are essential pieces of documentation. Um, so the boxes need to be filled. If you try and progress the application and you haven't filled those boxes, uh, then you just won't be able to go to the next page. There are some people who recommend if you're not ready to fill in those boxes, you upload other documents sort of as placeholders so that you can progress. Of course, you then need to be super, super careful that you come back and you take out your shopping list or whatever it is you had uploaded there um, and upload the correct document instead. Criteria two, which we've already discussed a bit, is servicing community and industry needs. This is, um, I'm, I won't go into it in detail since we've already had a look at it, um, but in terms of the documentation or the evidence that you really need to supply, those letters of support are really, really important. Um, you want them from employers and from the other organisations that will partner with you. If you have a kind of program where you're going to have to help your participants meet a whole lot of needs, you probably want letters of support from the agencies you refer to. So for my imaginary Get Set for Work program, for example, I might want to have letters of support from a local um, young person service, maybe a youth homelessness service, youth counselling service, maybe a family support service. Um, so those would be my probably my key referral pathways. I'd want to have letters of support from all those organisations saying we support Kelly's Get Set for Work project and um, we have agreed to provide, you know, whatever it is, accelerated movements through wait lists or, you know, a group counselling group support once a week or whatever it is that they're going to provide. You want that to be detailed in there. This is really about if we think about the purpose of this criteria and what the assessor wants you to show, is about showing how you've got that really solid understanding of your community and what it needs. 
that's really what it comes down to and that you can provide the detail and the data that supports your claims about it. And this is what criteria two looks like on the submission portal. You can see again, you've got the 2800 characters and you need to address several lines of <laughs> requirements in that 350 to 400 words. Um, you are then expected to attach your letters of support. Um, and that again is a mandatory box. So you're not gonna be able to progress through the application unless something is in that attachments box. Do remember until you submit, you can go back in and you can edit and change and delete and add and all of those sorts of things um, up until the point you hit submit. So feel free to you know, start playing around with it and putting things in, just making sure that you uh, have the time to go back and make sure everything is all correct before you hit the submit button, because once you submit it, there's nothing else you can do. All right. Criteria three is the strategies to assist participants. As I mentioned earlier, we really encourage you, if you haven't already, to watch the intro webinar. It has fabulous examples of what some of these um, strategies are. Uh, you must, absolutely must, have a training and support plan or template that shows how you will address expected or arising needs. Now, obviously you don't, you're not running the project, you don't have participants, so you can't show, you know, in the real world, this is one of our participants and this is what we're doing to support them. But Desbit wants to see that you have a plan in place that will support your staff to identify what those support needs are and then meet them. I believe there may even be a suggested template in the um, uh, applicant guide on the Desbit website. Um, things that might also help could be uh, policies and procedures around addressing particular risks or vulnerabilities. So cyberbullying policies are a big one um, at the moment with all of the challenges in that area. What this is really asking about, what this really the purpose of this is to show that you understand the specific challenges that are likely to arise in your group and you have pre-planned methods for meeting them. And that doesn't mean you've already, you know, carried out any of these, but you have a plan to identify needs. You have staff who are appropriately equipped to identify and respond to needs. And you have either within your organisation or in your partner organisations, the capacity to meet those needs. Now, a few um, things to think about. This is not by any means a comprehensive list, but just some of the really common needs that arise for participants in SKU programs are um, issues around cultural safety and cultural responsiveness. So we need programs where obviously the material, so the training material that the RTO delivers, um, but also the organisational materials that you might provide to people are, are culturally responsive and promote cultural safety. Maybe there need to be some things set up so that people who have particular cultural responsibilities have some flexibility to meet those. Uh, you might need to consider different days and times for participation. If you're looking, for example, at a, at a cohort who have children who finish uh, daycare or kindy at 2.30, there's no point having a requirement that they attend classes until four, that sort of thing. Um, you will need to consider accessibility and transport, particularly if you're working with people with disabilities or people who don't drive. Um, and this comes up a lot for the more regional areas. You may need to, for example, um, have either organisational vehicles that you can use to transport participants to training events or industry events, um, or perhaps one of the things that one of your partner organisations can provide is in-kind support. So maybe they have a transport service that they can um, come in and help with. You may need additional learning resources, particularly for participants who have higher uh, learning language, literacy, numeracy and digital needs. Sorry, they added a D to LLN recently and I'm still trying to get my head <laughs> around it. I'm too used to saying LLN. Um, additional resources or time um, for those students will be essential. Um, lots of job related support. So resume writing help navigating online job sites, uh, helping people dress and practice for interviews, those sorts of things, and the whole range of psychosocial needs. You know, maybe that's mental health support, alcohol and drug support, 
um, family, legal, whatever, um, are just some of the things that you'll need to think about. Now, the strategies to assist participants, again, we've got five or six lines of detail that they want you to cover in your response with, again, those 350 to 400 words. So that's quite a lot to pack in. Um, and you do need to upload that template of a training and support plan um, before you can proceed. Now, it's really important to recognise with that training and support plan, that is not the same as your registered training organisation's training plan. Uh, they will have one that is about the delivery of the training um, and the assessing of learners. Um, that's fine and good. That's something they need to do to meet their responsibilities. Uh, but that this training and support plan that we're talking about and that you need for your SKU application is more holistic support for learners for whom the mainstream training approach is not going to work as well. Now, criterion four, we've got outcomes. So this is, um, again, showing the solid rationale for your project idea, showing that the particular training you're going to provide meets a need that exists in your community and will help people get the skills they need to move into work, particularly sort of entry level skills gaps in local industries. Um, there aren't any mandatory requirements for those documentation uploads for this criterion, but we strongly, strongly suggest that you consider what you could provide as evidence. So you might have, again, a project report from a previous, um, a previous program. It may not be a SKU program, but something that shows how effectively you support people who are facing barriers to employment in your area, for example, would be really good here. Um, letters of support for this one could also be useful. If we take a step back from the detail, think what is this criteria really asking about? What's its purpose? It's pretty simple. They just want to see that there's a really solid logic behind your ideas for how what you're going to deliver is going to lead people into jobs. Uh, the uh, page where you upload the information, again, lots of, lots of requirements there and not a lot of space to do it. Um, but we will go on to some tips for getting all the information you need to in there in just a minute. Uh, I do appreciate your coming through uh, the relatively dry area with all these selection criteria, application criteria, sorry, here. Um, if you feel a little bit overwhelmed by those um, requirements, please be assured that the SKU assesses one, understand that the task you've been set is really hard, and two, they really want you to succeed. The people who are involved in SKU assessments love SKU. They want to see good projects get funded. So their advice, if you want that sort of overall general sort of purpose for the application you're putting in, you need to show your connection to community and local employers and how what you do will lead people into employment. That's the big thing for those first four criteria. What's left then, of course, is everyone's favourite subject, the budget. Who doesn't love numbers? We are going to run through this pretty quickly, but again, there is much more detail about what can and can't be included um, in the application guides on the Desbit website. There are two things you need to really consider here. One is your budget, which is for um, the things that you need funding to pay for, basically, the SKU funding that you're applying for. Um, and the other side of it is your in-kind contributions. Now, in-kind contributions means those things that your organisation is doing or you've arranged with partner organisations to do uh, that will not be funded straightforwardly from the SKU uh, pool, uh, but is what you're offering to sort of value add. And you can't necessarily do a very detailed, you know, cost per item for in-kind contributions, but it is a really good idea to detail what types of contributions they can do and then give a ballpark estimate of the cost that, that is being provided in kind. So say for my Get Set for Work program, maybe I've got a partner organisation who uh, works with young people and they are going to run a one and a half hour group once a week for eight weeks for my participants as they start the program. Um, that is going to be two of their staff members um, and I know that they have maybe 10 hours of prep and five hours of reporting um, to do as part of that. So I can add up 
the numbers for all those staff hours, times them by two because it's two staffers, and I've got a ballpark estimate of what that in-kind contribution, um, the monetary value of that in-kind contribution is. Now, the key thing to remember with this cost and value for money criterion is it is not about trying to lowball and you know beat the competition by giving the lowest price for funding. One thing to remember is that the Desbit staff have a good sense of what it costs to roll out a SKU program. A lot of them have been assessing them for years. So if your budget is really under what would be expected for the project you're planning on rolling out, that's actually going to undermine your application and reduce your likelihood of getting funded. What they want is a realistic budget and set of in-kind contributions that looks like it's likely to be in the ballpark of the approximate requirements for actually rolling out what you're planning to roll out or what you said you'll roll out and that it's cost effective so not that it's the cheapest and this also differs from the different programs so if we think about um, I think job skills is one of the least uh, intensive programs get set for work is one of the most we would expect the per participant cost for get set to work to be much much higher than job skills so just keep in mind that you're not trying to underbid anyone else. Just be realistic, reasonable and detailed in what you include. Now, there are several sort of packets, I suppose, of, of funding types of funding inclusions we want to think about. Staff wages is the obvious one. We need to be able to pay the staff who are going to deliver the program. Administration costs. Now, Desbit wants to see line items and details here no sort of $10,000 admin costs. Actually, how is that going to be divvied up and spent? Important to recognise that routine expenses, rent, interstate travel, staff training and RTO materials are not to be included in costs. Um, just a note on the RTO materials, it is expected that the RTO provides all of the learning and assessment materials that they would usually provide to students with the contribution either through user choice or certificate three guarantee funding that is sort of worked into the overall SKU budget. Materials and equipment can be a bit of a tricky area. Again, like admin, uh, we want line items and approximate costings for materials and equipment, but it cannot include assets or capital equipment purchases. There are some other costs that you might come across. Uh, participant support expenses would be a really common one for that. You might also have some non-accredited, sorry, non-accredited training um, that you want to provide uh, that isn't part of what the RTO provides, but you know will help address a barrier. So just think about the whole range of things that you're proposing. Try and get a cost estimate around all of them and make sure it's it's reasonable and justified. A solid budget is honest. It's really important. Um, it needs to include even those things that aren't funded in terms of the money allocated in the grant. So those in-kind contributions. Double check or ideally have someone else double check the guidelines to make sure everything you've included in your budget is a viable inclusion. It's not one of the excluded costs. Um, and if you do want some more guidance on writing a budget, and I suspect you do, I know I would in your position, and we do have um, a set of resources linked there on that page. So when you get the presentation, you can just click that link, and you'll go straight there. Um, if nothing else, we hope you take these five tips away from our talk about budgeting. Uh, do check your eligible and ineligible costs. Make sure you include staffing costs. And when you do that, think about not just the wages as they stand now, but are there any wage increases that will be coming up, um, super increases, uh, work cover expenses, all of those sorts of things. Uh, SKU really encourages you to spend locally when you can, so consider local suppliers rather than contracting with more distant suppliers for the things you need to purchase or the services that you're providing to support participants. Be detailed, don't do big lump sums, do those line items. And the final one might seem like a bit of, um, like it shouldn't need to be said, but do make sure, double check 
that it line, that all adds up. The number of applications that come in where the total for the budget isn't actually what all the line items equals is quite staggering. Overall, for our evidencing our, our assessment criteria, you've got a few tips. Map out what you need for, from the start. That'll really save you time. I know it feels like it's using more time, but it will save time in um, in the pro across the process. Uh, if you've got that reference library already set up, that's going to save you even more time and make sure your letters of support are current and specific. Getting generic or out of date letters of support is a, just a significant problem and one that, yes, it takes some time to address because going backwards and forwards to get a letter of support that meets your needs does tend to take a while. But for SKU in particular, that's absolutely essential. All right, so we're going to spend uh, about 10 minutes just thinking a bit more about how you actually word your responses. And this is uh, tricky. I'm not going to not going to get around that. Um, and what I would suggest on all of these points is if you can get someone who isn't familiar with your project to read your drafts, you will get feedback that helps you on each of these points. Um, we, I write a lot for as part of my role. I know I need someone else to look over what I do. It doesn't matter how many times I look over it myself, there will be mistakes that I miss. There will be things that I think are clear that aren't, all that sort of thing. So just please get someone who doesn't know what you're talking about to read your responses. If they think your responses are clear, concise, comprehensive, persuasive and on point, then you have a much better chance that the assessor will agree. So in terms of writing clearly, use simple language. Uh, we sometimes try to impress people by using, you know, multisyllabic terms and jargon that doesn't tend to be very helpful. Um, that is often off-putting for the people reading responses. And it can be quite um, counterproductive, I suppose. Sometimes when we use fancy language, we think that we're being impressive, but the person reading it might suspect that we actually don't know what we're talking about and we're just trying to look like we know what we're talking about. We also risk if we're unclear in how we write and we don't get our point across in a very straightforward way, it just won't be properly understood. And if it's not well understood, it's less likely to be believed. There are lots of tricks that work for both writing more clearly and more concisely, which is what the next one we're going to talk about. Think about any phrases that could be covered with a single word, that sort of thing. Um, if you use utilise, you can cut it down to use. You save half of the, uh, the character count with that simple change, all of those sorts of things. Um, you don't need to use a lot of adverbs. Adverbs are those uh, describing words that go along with, with verbs or nouns, action or naming words. We often like to use them to, we think we make our point more clearly if we add some sort of contextual information or additional description. Um, in fact, our writing is often clearer if we just get rid of them. So um, one of the sort of rules of thumb, and it doesn't quite work all the time, but generally an adverb will have the letters L-Y at the end. So if you go through what you're writing and you just look for all of those words that end in L-Y, ask yourself for each one of them whether that's actually doing any work, and if it's not, get rid of it. Now, writing concisely, some of those um, steps from writing clearly will work here as well. Um, a couple of other things that are useful to note with SKU is you can use bullet points. So uh, you can cut down um, the amount of repetition in words by using a bullet point list or that sort of thing. Um, you can use acronyms and abbreviations. Just make sure the first time you use them, you do the full phrase or the full name and then in brackets. So for example, I might say the Queensland Council of Social Service, brackets QCOS, and then I can use QCOS in the rest of that response. Note, however, that with some uh, SKU, some Desbit regions, SKU applications have different parts read by different people. So each time you use an acronym in, um, in a particular uh, criteria response, make sure you define it again, because the person who is assessing uh, response two might not be the same person who's assessing response four. 
Now, writing comprehensively is what gets really tricky, I think, when we're trying to be clear and concise, because we really need to cover all of those points um, that each assessment criteria requires. And this is where going back to our process for pulling apart uh, what's being asked and kind of divvying up um, a certain character or word count for each point can come in really handy. When you're doing that, you will be much more likely to get everything answered that you need to, um, but it will also help you uh, avoid the mistake of putting irrelevant information in. So one of the things that often happens if we just sit down to sort of write something off the top of our heads is we'll include things that feel like they're relevant that really aren't. Whereas when we pull things apart and we, we know, okay, well, I've got, you know, 800 characters for this bit and 600 for this bit and 1,000 for this bit, we focus on the bits, we, everything then comes together in an answer where there's only relevant material being covered. Uh, we also have a couple of suggestions specific to SKU for these, uh, these particular, uh, this particular point on writing comprehensively. You want to make sure that you cover things like that capacity that experience managing funds, that experience delivering relevant uh, programs. You must include staff details or position descriptions. You will need at some point to really outline clear recruitment and selection strategies and your partnership with the RTO. Those things are all part of answering the questions that you're going to come across, and they may not be for some of your other um, grant applications, but they're essential for SKU. So if you've done all of your answers and you're sort of just doing your double checking, I suggest you use this list, make sure, you know, go through what your answers are and make sure you can tick off every single one of those points um, somewhere in, in your application before you submit it. All right, we're on to our P, which is writing persuasively. Now, if you have written clearly and concisely, you're already well on the way to writing persuasively because uh, if you are clear and easy to understand, you're more likely to be believed anyway. Some other things you can do to improve how persuasive your answers are is you can use specific claims and provide evidence for each of them. So avoid you know, vague or unsubstantiated statements. You know, our organisation as an industry leader is one of those things that kind of gets said quite a bit, but it doesn't actually tell an assessor anything. So avoid that kind of thing. Be really specific. Uh, use as current information sources as you can and use information sources that are really specific to your area if possible. Um, showing, uh, say, employment data from your region last year is much, much better than showing Queensland-wide employment data from five years ago, for example. Um, you can also include your chances of being well understood by just matching your language to that that the funder uses. So I know um, one example for me would be I would usually say community organisation, but I know Desbit uses the phrase community services organisation. So when I'm writing, if I was writing an application, I'd probably just make sure I use community services organisation. Um, slight tweak, but we'll just make it so much easier for the person reading it to know exactly what I'm talking about and link it to what they know of the requirements. We have some tips on authoritative sources for data. The Australian Bureau of Statistics is a great one, and basically any government publication will be considered um, a, an authoritative or, you know, a genuine source. It's not sort of Kelly's blog. It's, it's something that's gone through a quality control process. And that includes local level data and your LGA data, your local government uh, association level data. Universities and research bodies um, also have quite a lot of data that can be relevant. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, it can be tricky to navigate all of that data, but we've got a webinar coming up. We've got another one that's on YouTube that you can see, um, and we have those data dashboards on the QCOS website. So you've got a few starting points for that if you're a bit nervous uh, about the data and evidence side of things. Now, finally, for our C3PO, we've got our O staying on point. This is... Uh, Probably one of the trickier things for writing is, is that often there are things that we, yeah, we think feel relevant, but they're not. So we want to do that double check and potentially having someone 
other than us double check and tell us which things don't seem to quite answer what the assessment criteria is asking for. Make really clear reference to the requirements that, that you're meeting. You know, it's, it's one thing to provide an example, but if the assessor can't really easily see the link between your example and the assessment criteria, then it's a waste of words. So really make explicit, you know, we have shown that we have the organisational capacity through rolling out X projects, that sort of thing. Really focus on the benefits and the value add that you're trying to highlight in your application. Make sure that, that your point and your value are just really clear throughout. Now we're going to just uh, highlight as we wrap up our, our talk about um, writing itself that there are some really common issues, um, failing to address all the criteria um, or failing to provide the evidence or the examples that back up each, each aspect of the criteria is really common. There is a problem if project summaries are too vague or they don't have clarity or, or detail in the information. So getting a, that really clear sense from your planning work of what you're proposing is essential. Uh, there have been uh, applications that have really clearly shown that, that there's not that understanding of the local cohort there and they get rejected for that reason. Um, be really careful about cutting and pasting from previous applications. As I mentioned, <laughs> inaccurate information often slips in that way. Um, and uh, Budgets with incorrect numbers is a is a common pitfall as well. Now, if you're concerned about your writing, there are a couple of apps that might help. Um, these are not as good as having a good reader who's not familiar with the program um, have a look for you, but there's apps there if you don't have that available. We do have a couple of notes on AI. Um, it's really tempting. We know a lot of people are using AI to develop grant responses. Um, that could be useful if you're getting ideas from it, but it also comes with um, quite serious concerns. So any information put into a text generator is no longer confidential. That's essential to be aware of. Um, and uh, text generators often, it's called hallucinate. <laughs> they uh, come up with examples and even research references for studies and things that don't actually exist. So. Um, be really mindful if you are going to use AI to help you in writing your responses that you remain responsible for what is in there um, and any inaccuracies are your responsibility, not the text generators. Um, if you do want to use it, we would suggest, yeah, come sort of giving, say, chat GPT the in instruction of, you know, what topics do I need to cover or, you know, uh, show a, uh, you know, a breakdown of, of responses, you know, show an example response, that sort of thing, but don't actually use that for writing your response yourself. Uh, when you get to the end of this process, remember there are checklists on the portal um, and on the back of your project page. <laughs> Those are um, really useful just to double and triple check that you've got everything you need to there. Um, and remember that once you submit your application, you can't go back in. So <laughs> just triple check everything beforehand, press submit, and then relax a bit before you start uh, planning how you're actually going to roll things out. We do have a few more slides at the end of the presentation here um, on the Human Rights Act and Child Safe Organisations. Um, I'm not going to go through them. We have such a packed um, schedule and I, I do apologise for that. Um, but they are there as uh, a reference for you. So they're absolutely packed with links about the responsibilities of community services organisations under the Human Rights Act and the National Principles for Child Safe Organisations if they receive government funding. And this is the key thing. If you get a SKU grant or any other grant from a uh, Queensland government source, you will be considered a functional entity under the Human Rights Act when it comes to using that funding. And that means that you need to consider the Human Rights Act in the decisions that you make. 
So we've got some really great resources from the Human Resources, sorry, Human Rights Commission um, linked on some of those slides. And pretty much the same goes for the nat National Principles for Child Safe Organisations. Um, there is a move now to uh, promote child safety in terms of addressing some risks that organisations haven't necessarily recognised before. When it comes to child safety and human rights, this is nothing super new to community organisations. We have all been trying to do these things for a long time, but it's just about some additional standards and, and some additional resources that are there to help you do it if you get that funding. So as I said, it's time for us to wrap up, so I'm not going to go through them um, in detail now, but please do um, have a good read and click through to those links that are embedded in the slides. They're really, really useful. So that is 11.30 for us and we just got here on time. Um, if you would be so kind, please do answer our, um, our survey questions that are going to pop up in a moment. Um, it is really, really useful to us if you do. This is how one of the main ways that we uh, identify areas for improvements in what we provide um, and we, we review it, we use it, and we try as best we can um, to create resources and programs, workshops and webinars that are actually of use to the sector. So please, please do um, respond. Uh, let us know what you think. Um, if you have ideas about things you would like us to cover um, that we're not already covering or different aspects that you'd like to see covered, um, please feel free to get in touch. There'll be an email address in the, the email that I send you shortly with resources. You're most welcome um, to get directly in touch with us. Um, let us know what you think and what you'd like to see, what would be useful to you. Um, yeah, and other than that, thanks so much for coming along. Please do let us know if you submit a SKU, um, a SKU application. Yeah, tell us how you go. Um, we'd be really excited to hear if you get some funding, what you do with it. We don't often get to hear those good news stories. So just let us know. Um, and other than that, I wish you all the best of luck with your application.